is an element of E minus C. It's what we'd like to show. But how do we know it's true? Well, suppose AX plus BY is still is an element in C. We know AX is an element of E minus C and BY is an element of C. So replacing AX by X and BY by Y, we get X plus Y is an element of C. So we took two elements in B minus C, added them to an element of C. Seems weird. Let R be greater than or equal to zero. Two R X is an element of B minus C. How do we know this? Well, X is an element of B minus C, and two R is positive. Good. We can write this as x plus y plus x as r x plus y r x minus y. Right? R x r x r y minus r y. Okay. We assumed this was an element of c. It's a bad assumption, but it's our assumption. So this must not be an element of C, i.e. it's an element of B minus C. Now, let C1 equal the set Z plus R X minus Y such that Z is an element of C, R is going to equal to zero. Okay? We know Z C is a subset of C1. This tells us y minus x is contained in c is contained in c1. Do you think you know what I'm going to do next? 0 is not an element of c by construction. c is only internal points. These are only things not in c plus things in C, so 0 is not in C, and C is convex, uh, C1. So C1 is an element of C, of uh, script C. It's a bigger element of script C than C. Therefore, C1 equals C. But this has an element of B minus C. That's kind of difficult. So, C1, so we made some mistake here. Our mistake was this assumption here. x plus y is not an element of c. Okay. So, we have enough 
we've shown, we've built up our C enough to finally found, find our null space. Let V naught, no, this is usually going to look like a null space of linear functional, equal V minus C union minus C. Now let's take a look at the C union minus C. C intersect minus C, well, if X is an element of C, intersect minus c, then minus x is an element of c. Right? So, 1 half x plus 1 half minus x must also be an element of c. But this is a fancy way of writing 0. So this is actually the empty set. Okay? Now, for V naught to be the null space of a linear functional, it must contain zero, which it does, and it must have Co-dimension 1. Let's show that. Let x and y be an element of v naught. Oh, uh, well, be an element of v minus v naught, which just equals c union minus c. We can assume, so we want to show there exists an a and b real numbers with ax plus by an element of v naught. Okay. So, we can assume By, by either taking minus a, by either multiplying x by minus if we need to, and y by minus if we need to, x is an element of c, and y is an element of minus c. Now we're going to come up with two tricky sets. One we're going to call s naught, which is going to be the set, t, and close 0, 1, such that x plus t, y minus x, is an element of c. Now suppose t is 0. x is an element of c by hypothesis. And so 0 is definitely an element of s naught. S1 is going to be equal to the set T and 0, 1, such that x plus T, y minus x is an element of minus C. Suppose T is 1. Well, x 
plus minus x is 0, and y is in minus c by hypothesis. So 0 is an element of S0. 1 is an element of S1. More is true. We know C has only internal points and is convex. So S0. Also, we know Y is not in C. So 1 is not in here. So S0 looks, well, S0 is an open, is a open convex subset of 0, 1. We know 1 is an S1. And we know minus c is convex in only internal points. S1 is an open convex subset of 0, 1. And we know minus c and c are disjoint. So if x plus t, y minus x is in c, then it's not in minus c. So S1 union S0 does not equal, well, so S1 and S1 intersect S0 equals the empty set. But 0, 1 is connected. Well, that means S1 union S0 does not equal 0, 1. So, there exists a T in element of 0, 1 minus S1 union S0. What does this mean if T is not in either of these? It means X plus T y minus X is not in C, and x plus ty minus x is not in minus C. So, B naught, which equals B minus C, has in it um, C union minus C, has as an element x plus t y minus x. But this we can rewrite. That's going to equal x minus tx, or 1 minus t, x plus ty. This is an element of v-naught, which is exactly what we wanted. V naught is codimensional one. Okay, we're getting into the end game. We have our V naught. Let rho be a linear functional. with no space be not. We know zero, we know for all C in C, C is not an element of, is not in V zero. So rho of C equals the empty set. Play it. Rho of C does not equal zero. Wrong line. Well, C is convex. Since C is convex, the set T 
such that t equals rho of c for c and c, this must be convex. The image, we're going to call that rho of c. Rho of c is convex, and it does not contain zero. So, either rho of c is greater than or equal to, is greater than zero for all c and c, or is less than. But we can always take minus rho. Minus rho has the same null set as rho. In which case, minus rho of c is greater than zero. So we can just assume rho of c is greater than zero. Now let's remember what C was. It's been a while. Well, what property C has? Y minus X is contained in C. Really, y C is our tool to discuss Y minus X. So, rho of Y minus X is going to be equal to zero for all c, for all y in y, x in x. Rho is a linear functional. Rho of y minus rho of x is greater than or equal to zero. But we can add things. Rho of y is greater than or equal to rho of x. This is true for all y and all x. So take the infimums of these row y's. No, these row y's are bounded. Let's clear up one thing quickly. Take x naught an element of x. Then rho y is bounded below by x naught. Well, this is a bounded below set, subset of R. So Therefore, let k equal the infimum of rho y for y an element of y. We see rho y is greater than or equal to rho x. Again, for all x. This is true for any x for all y. So this is true for the infimum over y and y. But this equals k. The reverse still works. Rho y is greater than or equal to k. This was just, we took the infimum. And we know that the hyperplane, h rho k, which equals v naught, separates x and y. So the first part of the Hanabinok theorem is finished. Huzzah! Okay, so let's try to recall in our mind the Hanabinok theorem. 
If x and y are convex, and one of them contains an internal point, we can separate them by a hyperplane. Good. Now, we recall one of them, yes, one of them was internal points. So, if y, without loss of generality, was only internal points, y is in a half plane, a open half plane. This is our next part to solve. Okay, so suppose y is only internal points. Let y be an element of y, okay? And suppose rho of y equals k. Now, let x be an element of x. y is internal, and x is an element of our vector space. So, there exists a c greater than zero, where for zero less than or equal to a less than c, a x plus y is still in y. Okay? Then we take rho a x plus y. Plus we want, it's not clear what we want. Oh, yes. We don't want x to be, just be an x. We can take some x. We can assume k is greater than 0. And we can take an x where rho of x is less than 0. Right? This is linear functional. This goes to all of R. So, you can do this. Rho of ax plus y is going to equal a rho of x plus y. But this is a negative number. This is strictly less, uh, rho of y, this is strictly less than rho of y, which equals k. But this is an element of y. And it's less than k, but k is the infimum in y. Contradiction. Rho of y does not equal k. Okay? There's one more thing. Suppose x is also only internal points. That means x is also always strictly less than k. That means that x is in the other half plane. So we get h strictly separ separates x and y.
And I lost my eraser. That's okay. So today, we discussed what half planes are, what hyperplanes are. We proved the Hahn Banach theorem, the Hahn Banach, the real vector space Hahn Banach separation theorem. We saw Zorn's lemma used. So why is this one of the most important tools in functional analysis? We knew we needed some properties for a set. And so we assumed, let's take all sets with part of the properties we want. And we found the biggest such thing. And that had all the properties we want. So often in functional analysis, if you want something, assume you have it, and run until you know you have it. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.